Recording is now being recorded. All right. Sounds like we are all ready to go. So hello again. As I mentioned, my name is Jen Hughes with the National Endowment for the Arts. For the Arts, I oversee the Citizens Institute on Rural Design Program from the NEA uh, place, working closely with the team from Project for Public Spaces and Norton Family Foundation, folks that I know that you all have gotten to know quite well over the last couple months. We are absolutely thrilled about this year's cohort of workshop hosts, seven workshops to be taking place um, beginning this fall into the spring. And we thought that this would be a fantastic way to bring you all together and make sure that a very important funding agency um, is on your radar, the U.S. Department of, Rural, uh, US Department of Agriculture, the Rural Development Program. So I'm really pleased to introduce to you Farah Ahmad. Uh, she is personally one of my most favorite people in government, has many great ideas to share with you, and has been incredibly accessible and helpful um, in so many of the projects that the NEA has been working to collaborate on. And she works as a program manager and desk officer at USDA, where her work primarily focuses on sustainable community economic development and anti-poverty initiatives in both rural and tribal communities. Formerly, she served as a senior policy analyst at the Center for American Progress, where she examined the intersection of public policy and race in the United States, with particular attention to demographic changes, education, and economic mobility. Sarah holds a Master of Public Affairs degree from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University, and a Bachelor of Science degree from Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations. So it is my pleasure to introduce and turn this presentation over to Sarah so she can walk you through the ins and outs of USDA. Take it away, Sarah. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's really a pleasure to join you. Uh, and it really has been my pleasure to get to know the National Endowment for the Arts and all the wonderful programs uh, that they work on and the communities that they serve. And, you know, as we got to know each other better over the course of the last year, we really found that we're working in a lot of the same places and there are so many uh, synergies uh, between our organizations in rural communities and in tribal communities. So very excited to be here today. Thank you so much. Um, I want to get started. Uh, and just say that this is going to be more of an informal conversation. So, um, you know, please feel free to, uh, you know, when we get done with this, there's just a, a small number of us on the line. We can just have a, a great dialogue at the end. So I'll just kind of run through some of the top line stuff so we have some good content to discuss. So like Jen said, my name is Farah Ahmad, and I work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, in our mission area called Rural Development. And you know, what we're really going to discuss today is who is USDA Rural Development, and then also um, what do we do? Uh, what kind of technical assistance or financing do we provide, and how might that be useful to some of the things that you're working on today? And then thirdly, once you know about some of the things that we offer, um, how do you actually use them, and how do you actually get your work done? So let's start from the beginning, who we are. So uh, like Jen said, uh, we're U.S. Department of Agriculture, and we have what's called, uh, we're divided into mission areas. Those are really just big subdivisions of USDA, which is actually a pretty behemoth federal agency. And we are within the rural development mission area. And really what rural development is, is uh, we try to increase the economic opportunities and improve the quality of life for rural, America, uh, rural Americans. And we really do a lot of that um, partnering with communities to do community development work, to do economic development work, and we'll discuss a little bit about what that means just momentarily. So within rural development, uh, we actually have a portfolio uh, that's about $38 billion in loans, loan guarantees, grants, uh, and other various technical assistance programs just within this current fiscal year. So we have a fairly large portfolio. One thing to keep in mind is that USDA is its actually kind of like a big bank. And so while we do have grant programs, the, the majority of what we do are actually loans. But we do have grants and we do have technical assistance as well. 
The rural development is really organized into three major buckets. So the first is rural utility service. The second is rural housing service. And the third is rural business cooperative service. And we'll go into what each of those means and what kind of programs they offer. But just sort of um, generally speaking, uh, on, for rural utility service, we do a lot of work around water and waste systems, around broadband, telecom, uh, those kinds of programs. In rural housing service, we do a lot of work around multifamily housing, single family housing, and then also essential community facilities. Um, really a lot of that brick and mortar infrastructure. And then uh, thirdly, in rural business cooperative service, we do a lot of grants and loans to businesses, whether that's small businesses, um, startups, private enterprises, or whether you know they're really big um, businesses that are central to an industry cluster um, that's really central to job creation in a town. And we just want to let you know one of our biggest strengths at USDA rural development is that we're actually very field-based. While we do have a national office in D.C., and that's actually where I sit, uh, we actually have over 400 area offices all over the country. And within those 400 offices across 47 states, we have 5,000 employees. And this is really different than a lot of other federal agencies, which um, can be more regionalized or more centralized. Um, but because uh, you know, rural communities are, are very dispersed and they're really uh, sometimes in, in far-reaching places. It's really important that USDA has a very strong field presence within the communities that we work in. And I wanted to show this to you. This is just a little snapshot of uh, our website. And so there's a link there at the bottom. It's www.rd.usda.gov. And you can actually browse your state and then find all the different offices that are in your state and are closest to the town or community that you work in. And you can get contact information very easily that way. But um, what I wanted to show on this next slide, and again, this is just a snapshot. I actually sent this document to Jen earlier. And if she hasn't sent it to you already, she, she will later. This is our, our contact list by uh, region, and it's for the team that I sit on, which is called Community Economic Development. And really, the job of, of my team and all of the people listed here around the country is to really work directly with communities to help them implement their long-term strategies for economic and community development. So, you know, a lot of USDA staff, like many other federal agency staff, they're focused on really running a, a sole program, whether that's around housing or if it's around business development. But the, the role of our team, the community economic development team, is to really work, work with the community holistically and think about how does business development or Main Street development tie to the community's housing needs? And how does that tie to you know, the needs of the educational system or the school system? And how does that tie to the arts? So these experts we have, these community economic development experts who um, are really all over the country and across 47 states, are really a great place to start to think through um, how many of the USDA programs can actually be used together. And we definitely also have regional staff as well. Um, and they are a great source of information. There's some of our folks who kind of help start our community economic development team in the first place. And I just wanted to show you sort of how we divide our regions, Midwest, Northeast, South, and West. And their information, again, will be on that contact sheet as well. So I just wanted to show this slide super briefly. I won't go through this whole thing. But um, these are some of the challenges uh, that you know we are seeing from the communities that we work with in rural America and that our field staff talk about a lot. And, and I wanted to share these because these challenges really inform the work that USDA does and, and our priorities. And so you know, one of those challenges is out migration. Um, of course, a lot of folks leaving rural areas and going to urban areas. Um, and relatedly, really a declining workforce. Uh, thirdly, an aging population. You may have heard about it as the silver tsunami. Um, and so really, a lot of um, folks who have had a lot of skills and expertise are really aging out of, out of the workforce. Uh, fourth is uh, 
a difficulty in accessing a college education for a lot of young people in rural communities. And last but not least, um, you know, 85% of the nation's poor are actually in rural areas and are persistently poor, meaning they've been poor for generation after generation. And so um, this is something that I, we at USDA view as a very big priority. And so these are kind of three of our sort of departmental strategic priorities I wanted to share with you. And so we are really focused on regional and place-based initiatives and strategies. So, so when we look for um, communities to work with and who we want to invest, um, you know, resources in, we're really looking to work with communities who are thinking, you know, broadly and regionally and how their community can work with the community next door and um, think through how they can capitalize on their, their, re their region's strength and really focus on how to mitigate their, their region's weaknesses as well. So a lot of that strategic thinking but yeah, and regional approaches, that's a very big priority for USDA. And again, um, number two, we have a big uh, commitment to poverty reduction, as I mentioned before, and also local food and the bioeconomy. Those are, um, those are priorities set forward to us by our Secretary of Agriculture. And then thirdly, kind of related to everything, that we're going to talk about today is really bringing capital to rural America um, to make sure that, that that infrastructure and that investment is there to help sustain rural communities and their, their workforces. Okay, so what is really available from USDA as far as technical assistance and financing? So I'm going to just show you sort of a brief list. Um, you know, we like I said, we have $38 billion of uh, direct loans, guaranteed loans, grants, and technical assistance in rural development. So I'll just kind of give you a top line. Um, and we are subdivided into those three different um, buckets. So the first I'll start with here is rural business and cooperative service. So as you can see, we have business programs, uh, we have energy programs, and we have cooperative programs. And again, these are some are grants and some are loans. Um, and I'll talk about a few that might be of interest to you on the phone. And the first that might be of most interest is the Rural Business Development Grant. And this is a, it is a grant, and it's one of our most flexible grants. And it's, it's oftentimes given to, to businesses to do a lot of different creative things, whether it's um, thinking about how a business wants to um, train uh, different folks in their community to be entrepreneurs, whether that business wants to expand some of its functions or some of its programs, um, or whether they're trying to provide other types of technical assistance to folks in their community or expand broadband programs. It can be really used uh, creatively uh, in a lot of ways that some of our other programs aren't so flexible. Um, and I'll go through some specific case studies with you momentarily. And I want to just mention again that we do have cooperative programs. And so we do have specialists who really focus on cooperative development, um, whether it's food cooperatives, artist cooperatives, housing cooperatives. It's really a model um, that has worked well in a lot of rural communities uh, where different organizations or folks can really band together and leverage their resources um, towards one main goal. And I'll, we'll go through an example of some cooperatives later. So the second agency I mentioned within rural development is Rural Housing Service. And here we do multifamily housing, we do single family housing, and then we provide grants and loans for essential community facilities. And it's this last one that will probably be of most interest to you all on the phone. So an essential community facility uh, could be exactly what it says in a way, um, but it could be a community center, it could be a town hall, it could be a school or a hospital or a, a fire department. So essential community facilities um, that are really at the core of a community. And like I said, our, through our community facilities program, we give out grants, direct loans, and guaranteed loans um, for infrastructure development, for new, constructor, new construction, for rehabilitation. But we also have technical assistance grants as well um, that can really help a community um, determine how they want to implement um, their community facilities in their program and how they want to expand and how they want to use them. And so we do provide technical expertise as well, which may be of interest to some of you on the phone. 
And lastly, uh, within rural development, we have a rural utility service. And here we have electric programs and telecommunication programs. And so, you know, there we do, we tend to do a lot of work around um, broadband, uh, distance learning, telemedicine, and general telecommunications infrastructure loans and, and guarantees, primarily because in a lot of rural communities we serve, um, in certain towns, they definitely have very strong um, internet access. But in other places, maybe just a few miles down the road, there is absolutely none. And so we really see um, our rural utility service as, as an opportunity not only to bring Internet access to individual homes, but also to businesses uh, all over rural America. And again, we have grants and loans for those opportunities as well. So again, this is just a very top line overview, but I'll go into some examples that might be more pertinent for the work that you all are doing. Um, and I did supply Jen basically what we call our USDA Rural Development Program Matrix. And there it actually lists every single one of our programs, but in a really easy and accessible way where it tells you in one phrase what it does, uh, who can apply for it, is it a grant or loan, and where you can find more information. So hopefully that will be sent out to you at the end of this presentation if it hasn't been already. Oh, and one thing I failed to mention is our rural utility service also has water and environmental programs. So that can be water, sewer systems, et cetera, and there are grants and loans for both of those as well. Okay, so how do we actually get it done? I thought the best way to describe how to use USA programs is actually just give a few examples for what other communities around the country have done. So the first um, thing to think about that made these communities really successful is that a lot of them kind of had an idea. They had a, had a dream for what they wanted to do. Um, and then they actually sat down and planned it. And the most successful communities that we've seen have been ones that have actually planned it, not just within their own organization, but with partners. Um, sometimes those are partners you would expect, and other times those are unusual partners. And we'll go through some examples of that. Um, but really what those partners do is help you leverage resources, um, whether those are resources other organizations have, like technical expertise, or whether it's resources that they bring in because of their relationships with the private foundation or with another federal agency that you could use in collaboration with each other. And one thing I want to just emphasize is uh, the, that planning piece. So planning has really become sort of uh, the way that USDA has viewed community development, is that we've seen that projects that have really um, been planned out well, and not only are, you know, there's a plan for the specific project, but projects that have been a part of a regional plan or regional strategy have been the ones that have had are the most success and have been the most sustainable over time. And so there is this new program um, called, that was part of the Farm Bill, called Strategic Economic and Community Development. And basically what this does is it sets aside funds from USDA Rural Development for four of our programs. And it actually sets aside those funds for communities who are trying to implement their regional plans. So basically, this provision is a way to reward communities for doing that hard work of bringing multiple partners together across town lines, across county lines, um, to really work together to develop one of those long-term strategic plans. And so we now have money set aside to help implement those plans. And the deadline for this year is June 30th, so it's right around the corner. But it will start again at the beginning of the fiscal year. So um, I wanted to just share that with you to keep it in mind because I know uh, many of you will be going through your, your workshops um, and something that may or may not come out of it is a, is a plan uh, for your community or for your region. And I wanted to share that with you because if you do decide to go the route of, of doing that regional planning work, that there actually are uh, funds to help you implement that plan. And I'm seeing this not only in USDA, but across federal government and other agencies um, that, in general, um, there are 
funds and thought and a lot of thinking towards how do we reward communities for really doing that hard work of regional planning. Okay, so let's get into some examples of how uh, different communities have used some U of USDA rural development funds. So the first is uh, from New England, from Battleboro, Vermont, and they actually used our community facilities grant. So I mentioned that to you earlier, um, and that's a grant that can be used um, for any of those essential community facilities from a hospital to a school to a town hall. Um, but in this case, they actually used it to purchase new equipment, which is also an allowable expense, and fixtures um, to expand their programs for their youth at their center for circus arts. And so this is a really interesting way um, that this grant has been used because traditionally uh, it was used for a lot of those, you know, very uh, foundational brick and mortar projects like your schools, like your fire departments, but it can actually be used for centers for the arts, for example, as in this case. And what that grant really allowed them to do was not only to improve some of their equipment and, and infrastructure, but it really allowed them to go the extra mile with their youth programming, which was focused on um, giving youth skills in team building, self-confidence, determination, um, and art and athleticism um, through the discipline of circus arts. And part of their program, which I think is really neat, is that as they train students uh, and young people at the New England Center for Circus Arts, is that the students actually have a component of giving back to the community through performances for local nursing homes, schools, and housing development. So this is kind of an example of you know, how one of our grants uh, has been used, and this one is called the Community Facilities Grant. Here's another example, and this one is from New Mexico. Again, it's our Community Facilities Grant. And I just included a second one because I wanted to show sort of the diversity of how this grant can be used. And this was used for the expansion of a, a weaving enterprise started by one woman and an apprentice in New Mexico. So it's actually a very small operation um, based on, you know, an, one artisan um, doing her work and actually supplying it out to folks who want to buy it. But this grant was used to expand that enterprise. And it expanded that enterprise to the, to the point where now um, this enterprise is training lots of similar artisans, so it's primarily Hispanic low-income artists. So training them not only to spin and dye yarn and actually weave um, traditional and contemporary designs, but actually going beyond that to include training for the artisans in how to do sales and how to be a, an entrepreneur. And so this community facilities grant was, was really used in a, a dynamic way to go from something very small to something very big, where now all of these weavers and their work are actually, um, through the organization's help, being sold to wholesale partners um, and catalog sales. So the next example, I really like this one. Um, because it shows um, how, you know, partnership and leveraging resources can really yield um, high impact results. So this is an example uh, from North Dakota. It was an artist housing project. And in this case, the USD grant was used, that was used was the Rural Business Development Grant. And that's that really flexible grant I talked to you about earlier. And it was used by Turtle Mountain Tribal Arts Association. And it was actually used for technical assistance. So experts got together to really help this arts association, which was a native arts association, to establish a storefront gallery for tribal artists. Now, these tribal artists were actually um, housed in the building that also had that storefront. And so the building was actually built from an art place grant, so that was from a foundation, and it was used by an organization called Magic City Lots to build that. So this project was actually a strategic alignment between uh, art place and USDA for this downtown artist housing project, which not only had a housing component for the artist, but also had um, you know, a storefront gallery component that they were able to use USDA World Business Development um, Funds um, to start that as well. And again, I wanted to, those are just three examples, uh, and I wanted to just give a, a, another nod to cooperative development. 
um, because we do have experts in that if you're, um, if you're interested in learning more, um, we can definitely talk to you about that, and that is something that is housed within USDA rural development. Here are a few more examples. Um, I think the community facilities and rural business development grants will really be apropos uh, for the conversation today, but here are just a, a, a small sampling of a few other things we can do. Um, we have a business and industry guaranteed loan, and uh, again, that, that is a loan, so it has to be guaranteed by a lender in a community. But in a case in Virginia, for example, it was used by a sports complex it was a large soccer and lacrosse facility just outside of Leesburg. Uh, and they used that, industry, that guaranteed loan to really do a huge expansion around that complex. Um, and here they were really thinking about how they can improve um, you know, their public spaces and how to make um, you know, recreation a really central piece of their community and attract the public there. And so they used this guaranteed loan to create a marina, a campground, a restaurant and a hotel complex um, as tourism was one of the goals of, of that community as well. Uh, another example we have is from Kentucky. This is our Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant Program. And, and this one was actually used by um, the South Kentucky Rural Electric Cooperative um, to fund and build marinas in their area as well. And lastly, just again on, on cooperatives, we do have cooperative development grants. Um, and we also have cooperative development expertise, and so we help actually develop cooperatives. And, that can, and I have two examples here which are very dichotomous. So the first is a public transportation cooperative, and this is actually near Yellowstone Park. And so folks actually got together in um, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho, the three states that really um, come together, and Yellowstone Park is in the middle. And they realized that a lot of the communities surrounding the park um, didn't have great transportation in these rural communities to get from one place to the other, but Montana was sort of doing its own public transportation. Montana, uh, Wyoming was doing their own public transportation. So they, the states actually came together, formed a transportation cooperative with the help of USDA, and actually found out how they could pool their resources, um, make sure that their different lines that they ran for their bus lines uh, really Hello? filled gaps and um, made sure that community members could actually get around. And so that was something they did by banding together. And then uh, just a really different example, we, we actually helped start a, a wine tasting cooperative as well, and that was when several different uh, vineyards got together and they wanted to create a public space where folks could do wine tasting. But none of the vineyards separately really had the bandwidth to, um, to do that on their own. But by coming together, using some of our technical assistance from our cooperative experts, they really got the resources to put together a wine tasting cooperative um, public space. So again, um, those are just some examples, and this is sort of the model that we use is, you know, if you have a really great idea um, and you're working on a plan, please use us as a, a partner. Um, let us help connect you to other partners, too, so you can leverage your resources. Here's just some um, potential partners I, I put on a slide that we tend to work with. So oftentimes we work with councils of government, state agencies, uh, regional authorities, and economic development districts. Um, and also coalitions of towns and counties. And there's a National Association of Development Organizations, uh, NATO, and a National Association of Counties, that's NACO, and their websites are there, and that's a really good way to um, find out which of those coalitions or um, districts are within your, um, your region, if you don't know already. We actually do also work with a lot of special initiative coalitions. Um, so those are really coalitions of folks that are kind of coming together around a specific issue, whether that's regional planning or whether that's reducing poverty. And so those are places where partners are already working together. For instance, Promise Zones, um, that's a designation where folks are coming together to reduce poverty and reduce crime in their area. And so that's a good place to really plug in as well. And uh, I put the website up there because you can find uh, more information on our website about if you have one of those special initiative coalitions already doing work that you could plug into. Um, and then also we work with a lot of Main Street folks, so the Main Street Network, 
um, has a lot of uh, rural Main Street developers um, who I'm sure would be uh, interested in working with you. And one of our strongest partners is actually university extension programs. So if you have a university that is near your community or even perhaps you know a couple of counties away, they actually have dedicated experts who, um, who are focused on regional planning, uh, who are focused on community development and other things like that who will actually work with you and provide their technical expertise in helping you create a strategic plan for implementing uh, the projects that, that, that you are dreaming of. And then lastly but not least, um, local foundations or community and family foundations are also a great place to start reaching out. And sort of the next steps um, after this conversation, again, I know this is has been very sort of bird's eye view in a lot of ways, um, but I would encourage you to um, start doing some research on the financial and technical assistance we offer. Again, that program matrix um, that will be sent to you is a great first place to start. Um, secondly, I would encourage you to reach out to potential partners, um, some on that, that slide I just sent to you, um, and really whenever possible, try to you know, participate in that strategic um, community or regional planning effort. And I know that might come up in, in some of the workshops that you all are doing. Um, and like I said, in our experience at USDA, we've really seen how that has gone a long way for the sustainability um, of community programs. So I would really encourage that. And then lastly, please connect with us. Like I said, our strength is in being a field-based organization. So a lot of the staff at USDA, they are community members in your community. And um, they really have so much expertise in the different types of programs. And so um, please use that contact list. Reach out to those folks in your state. And really engage with them as early as possible um, to really maximize uh, your opportunities in working with us and really just build a, a great relationship with them. Because even if uh, something isn't a right fit this year, it could be, could be in the next year. And with that, um, I will sort of take any questions. Well, Farrell, that was really fantastic. Um, just wanted to thank you so much for going through that really helpful overview of all that USDA has to offer. And so I certainly would love to welcome all of you. Um, we had to, to mute the participants on the call. So to unmute, press star six. And certainly we'll welcome those questions. But before we go to the, the audience questions, I just had a few uh, little plugs and also a few points of clarification that I think would be really, really helpful. Um, one being, we do have on the line not only the uh, Citizens Institute and Rural Design workshop hosts that are coming this year, but also those who have participated in the past, one of which is actually a cooperative extension service. Um, up in New Hampshire, so that's fantastic that you called them out as great partners in this work. And a, a wonderful example of a really great um, marriage of sorts between USDA and NEA funding that I just would like to call out in Oregon County, Missouri, the Oregon County Food and Artisan Cooperative that exists down there. Rachel Reynolds Lester has been leading a great project that um, really began with the Citizens Institute and Rural Design Workshop, had a lot of participation with the local and state USDA folks that helped sort of help crystallize that workshop along with the community to provide some expertise around architecture and the development of the food cooperative, but also to be thinking about the sustainability of that business. And that was followed on by a National Endowment for the Arts our town grant award for the design and actual planning. And what's so nice is that hopefully there will be great potential to then utilize some of these funding, both the loan and grant funding for community facilities programs. So this is a great example that I think will really resonate with a lot of folks on the phone as you are listening. So let me just open it up to questions. As I mentioned, please um, unmute yourself, star six. And uh, welcome you to ask Farah. This is your chance to um, ask for anything you'd like. Oh, 
Well, I'd love to just hear from, from any folks um, who are, you know, about to start a workshop, you know, what types of, of projects are, are you thinking of or how you, have you started talking to folks already about what type of strategies you're, you're thinking of going over at your workshop? Are folks able to unmute themselves to participate here? This, this is Joe Kiley. This is Joe Kiley in, in Lyman, Colorado. It, it's really a question, not an answer to your to yours, because I don't know that we're far enough along to to be able to answer that. But in in initial contacts, uh, the community economic development team is a, is a new thing that I haven't heard of before. Should we be making our initial contact there? Or as we've done in the past, it's it's primarily been with our, our local office. Um, that, any feedback? That's a great question. That, I'm I'm glad you brought that question up. And so, so you're right. In a sense, the community economic development team is is new. It's, it's been around for a year. But in another sense, um, it's kind of been around for a while. It's more of a, a philosophy of trying to work across. Um, program silos, so, you know, a lot of our housing folks who are wonderful and great experts, they tend to just know sort of housing very, very well, um, and they don't necessarily know their, the business programs as well or the utility programs, and um, they might not know programs outside of USDA very well. And so the um, idea behind the Community Economic Development Team is that we have USDA folks who kind of know all of those things, maybe not as at the expert level, but still know them pretty in-depth, but are also um, really doing a lot of work in terms of working with other federal agencies. So there's a lot of opportunities to leverage funds that come from Department of Commerce's Economic Development Administration. We've had partnerships with, with HUD um, on some of their housing programs with NEA as, as as Jen has told you. And so our community economic development folks um, are really there to um, be a, a resource for a wide variety of resources and be folks who are really familiar with how a lot of those resources from federal agencies can be used together and can be used um, more holistically. So I would definitely say that you know, if you have a relationship with your local office, Absolutely, you know, you want to maintain that um, relationship, but, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to that state community economic development lead as well because that might open up a different uh, set of conversations that you might not just get with your local contact who's more kind of focused on their day-to-day -day program. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, could you talk a little bit about the um, regional plans? What sort of qualifies as a plan, um, particularly in terms of these workshops sort of kick-starting some of those broader planning processes in the communities? What might folks be thinking about um, in terms of that? Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, absolutely. So what's, what's really interesting, um, and I kind of mentioned before is that, you know, we at USDA are actually now giving um, priority to projects that are part of, you know, broader regional plans. And so we get that question a lot, you know, what is a regional plan? Uh, and it's actually kind of defined uh, within a statute uh, that we have at USDA. But the great thing about that is it's very, very flexible. And so the way that, that we define plan is that it based, a regional plan is that it basically has to be uh, something that has been put together with multiple stakeholders from multiple jurisdictions. And so a jurisdiction um, can be any number of things. So it's any sort of government-defined um, area. So that could be a village, it could be a parish, it could be a town, a county, um, it could be a, a state um, as well. So even from the smallest level to the biggest level, um, 
you know, if, if two or three towns got together and put together a plan, that could be considered a regional plan, even if all those three towns are within one county. So like I said, it's really flexible. Our definition of, of regional it just has to be more, you know, multi, more than one jurisdiction and that those, you know, different collaborators came together across those jurisdictions to, to put together a plan. And then other than that, um, what we really look for in a plan is that the, the, the community ha shows an understanding of the sort of the conditions of the region. So those could be economic conditions. Um, and it could also be sort of strengths and weaknesses um, of their communities. It could be an um, understanding of uh, natural assets, human assets, um, social, cultural assets. So just really showcasing an understanding of their region. And then um, the second piece would be, you know, given that they know that information um, and it's all well laid out, that there are sort of long-term strategies um, that really make sense given those conditions. So um, if there's lots of cultural assets in a community, some of their long-term strategies might be around um, maximizing cultural assets or connecting um, different sort of cultural and arts programming from one town to the next town to the next town. So it can really look very different and unique. Um, in other places, I've seen um, plans that are really focused on local foods because that's the strength um, of their community, and so their plan looks really different. Um, and then uh, after a plan kind of showcases its strategies, um, they really ha have to show a way to kind of how, how will they measure success? You know, how will they measure their own performance? And that's pretty much it. So our definition of plan is really, you know, multiple stakeholders um, from various jurisdictions, an understanding of their region, strategies for their region, uh, for community development, and then a way to kind of measure their own success, and that's it. This is Rachel Reynolds-Lester from Alton, Missouri, and I have a question about um, the regional plans. Is it possible through that program uh, to work across state lines, like uh, to think of a region as, say, the Ozarks, um, which encompasses parts of Arkansas, Missouri, uh, Kansas, and Oklahoma, would it be possible to do a regional planning around um, an area such as that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a state is a, a defined government boundary, so working across state lines is absolutely fine. Oh, that's wonderful. That opportunity almost never exists. <laughs> that's great. That's great to know. Sure. And, and you know, the thing about, um, you know, the money that we've set aside for, for this is that, you know, your regional plan can be multi-state, but it doesn't mean that all of your projects have to be multi-state. You know, you mm -hmm. can have, one you know, a project that, is, you know, it benefits that whole region that is, Kansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, but maybe, you know, it's a community center that's only in Oklahoma. That's okay, because it mm -hmm. kind of benefits that whole region. That was a great explanation, Sarah. Um, one other follow-up question that I had is, we have a couple projects that are workshops that are really focused on public space, park, uh, trails, wayfinding for recreational trails, but also um, perhaps even through some of the, the main streets in some of these locations. Are there other programs or things or resources that USDA may have connected to either recreational trails or um, public space? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, you know, I mentioned a, a couple of things in my presentation as far as you know, building marinas and, and campgrounds and things like that. But we actually have um, a whole presentation focused specifically on um, the recreational economy. And I'm happy to share some more, some more details from that. But I can just give a couple of examples. So um, in the, uh, I think this is in Colorado, um, the Powderhorn Resort, I actually used a $5 million business and industry guaranteed loan from us for a high-speed lift, um, which also detaches and allows for, for mountain bikes um, 
which really expands their opportunity year-round from just a, a ski resort to a mountain bike resort. So that was a pretty cool project um, that we saw coming out of our business and industry guaranteed loan program. And um, I think there was a program in, uh, I think it was North Carolina, in uh, the, I think it was called the Natahala Outdoor Center. And they also used that same um, uh, business and air industry guaranteed loan is for $7 million, uh, actually. So it's a pretty, you know, sizable loan um, to refinance debt and to fund uh, new capital for an outdoor guide service and to establish a retail store um, for their outdoor center. And so there are, there are lots of um, ways to use that business and industry guaranteed loan program. Um, and then also that rural business development grant, which I mentioned earlier, uh, I can think of an example from Oregon. Uh, the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission received uh, a, a rural business development grant, and they used it in conjunction with some other funding they got uh, for marketing and working, cap working capital for um, their salmon business. And so they were really capitalizing on, on sort of the unique strength of, of the rivers and the salmon industry in Oregon. Um, and so those are just some uh, that come to mind around um, sort of the recreational economy in general, but definitely we are seeing um, our programs being used more and more for those types of activities um, and kind of getting away from some of the traditional sort of hospital community center infrastructure and being used more creatively. And those are exactly the kinds of things that we're, we're looking to, to fund. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Any any other questions? Um, just sort of curious as to some things that folks are, are thinking about for their communities or any sort of broad strokes. I'd love to hear about them. This is Rachel Lester again. So we are planning on, well, we're getting ready to host a USDA technical assistance workshop. Um, in partnership with Smart Growth America for our community, which we're really excited about. Um, one of the challenges for us has been the lack of regional infrastructure, um, which led to my question about regional planning, thinking uh, across state lines. But also, uh, coming from a background of arts and humanities, um, you know, it's it's wonder. Third was you know the perfect uh, thing, the perfect vehicle for us to be able to communicate both our kind of agricultural interests and our arts and cultural interests. It's such a great program. Um, but in thinking about navigating USDA grant applications, the language is so different from um, what we're used to, how we're used to talking about what we do. Uh, I wondered if there are any resources available uh, that would allow for organizations to look at um, previous successful applications and kind of get a grasp, a better grasp of uh, kind of the language uh, of those applications. It's really kind of more of an economic development language in, in places like ours, for instance. We have no community development or economic development officers. Um, so it's hard sometimes to get that guidance. It would be really helpful to uh, have uh, previous successful applications to look at. Is that available anywhere? So I don't I don't think that it's available anywhere kind of you know publicly on the web per se. But mm -hmm. um, what I can tell you is if you you said you're in Missouri Mm -hmm. So I, I actually have a, a wonderful colleague, and she I listed her name on our on the map earlier with the different regions. Her name is Christine Sorensen, and she's actually a, a, incredible at um, helping translate some of the <laughs> government uh, jargon into you know how we normally speak every single day. And um, she's she's based in South Dakota, but she's our Midwest uh, Regional Community Economic Development Coordinator and has a ton of experience with doing a lot of really creative projects around 
um, local foods in particular. That's actually her sort of bread and butter. And I'd be happy to, um, you know, you will have her information on the contact list, her name's Christine Sorensen, but she will actually be able to kind of share with you some things that she's seen in some successful applications. And I think that she might be a really good place to start. That's wonderful. Thank you. And then my other question was, in talking to our uh, regional office, and by regional I mean uh, like Houston, Missouri, not, not that far away. We don't really have a local office that's fully staffed. Um, but they've been, it, it seems to be uh, not even a negotiation. Like we understand that it seems to be a really good fit, and they understand that it should be a good fit but trying to f figure out the right uh, program and the way, right way to approach it has been a challenge. And there seems to be some, um, I don't know, not misunderstanding, but a uh, question about which programs are state-funded programs and which ones are federal-funded programs uh, and what is available given that status um, for organizations to apply for. And, and so, sorry, I think I missed the, the question. Would you mind? Yeah, there probably wasn't. <laughs> that was probably more, more of a description of the situation that has happened uh, over the past couple of years. But I wondered, um, I guess, is there a breakout somewhere of, you know, if I went to the USDA um, site, is there a description of what's available on the national level as opposed to what programs are available and what level they're funded on the state level? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. Um, I can understand why that would be very confusing. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like I want to say the answer is yes. Um, that there should be a list of that, but I actually don't know. And so I'm glad you asked because I'm going to put that on my uh, list of things to do and make that some homework for myself um, because, you know, I, I just know off the top of my head what some of those are. Like I know rural business development grants, they're done at the state level as our community facilities. And I would say by and large, most of them are done through our state offices. Um, I would venture to say at least 80% of them are, and only a small portion will come up here to the national office. But I'm, I'm happy to dig around and, and see if we have just sort of a quick fact sheet or somewhere to find that information and get that to you. So um, if I can just get your email from Jen, um, we can be in touch. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Farah in the last five minutes? Uh, I think you gave us a lot to really think on, especially for those communities that have are continuing the work um, after the CIRD uh, workshop, and then the seven that are to come. But we have about five more minutes, so if anybody wants to jump in, please feel free to do so. This is this is Joe Kiley again in, in Lyman, Colorado. Um, our, our design workshop is going to be focused on wayfaring and, and development of the trail system. What, are there any programs that for later implementation would be uh, useful? You know, I actually don't know off the top of my head if community facilities works for trail development, but that's a good question. Um, and it's actually one that I uh, have been looking at not only within USDA, but actually at Department of Interior to see um, what they have. Uh, because I know that some, some communities we work with are trying to do the same thing, is not only trail development, but also using trails um, as a means to kind of connect trail towns to one another. Um, and so I, I want to say that there might be some some things available at Interior, but again, um, would be happy to kind of um, dig around and connect with you offline on that. Because I think I know uh, some people who might have a better answer than I do. Okay, thanks. Sure. 
This is Betty Hecker in Red Lodge, and I just want to say thank you. This has really provided us with a lot of good information for more than just um, our immediate project, because we have some other things going on in housing and also working with youth. So um, these are some areas we have not explored before. So thank you very much. Thank you. And, and please do feel free to, to reach out to me and, and to connect to folks in your state. Um, there's like I said, a, a ton of programs, and hopefully that program matrix that you get um, is a, just a really easy way to start skimming through them. Um, but they really can be, you know, we always say that USA Rural Development, our programs kind of in aggregate um, can be used to build a whole, a whole town itself because we can, you know, build all your okay. facilities, your housing, support your businesses, and so, um, if you have a project, you know, nine times out of ten, we, we have a tool. So it's just a matter of us kind of getting together and sitting down in a room and, and figuring it out together. And I hope that you view USDA as, as a true partner willing to sit down at the table with you and, and help figure some of that out. Well, thank you, Farah. Couldn't appreciate um, this conversation any more. It's been incredible to help sort of provide this blueprint of how to begin to think about partnering with USDA and what are some of those intersections, both at the regional, state, federal, and local level. So um, we did distribute before this call the matrix of the USDA programs, which I think will help to give a lot of spurring of thought as folks dive deeper into planning their workshops. And then also, I think that homework item of beginning to connect on the local level with the, the USDA staff, because I think they can be great resources in both the workshop planning stage, but also participation, and then also beyond in really building those relationships as you all move forward in your really important work that you're doing in communities. So with that, I just wanted to make sure that we ended on time. I want to thank everybody for participating and asking some great questions. And want to give a very special thanks to Farah for taking the time to share all of this incredibly resourceful information with us. And thanks to Orton and um, Project for Public Spaces for hosting. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.